Here are a few pertinent facts about products, mostly to do with morphisms. Now, we saw already, we've seen already, that the entire point of product is that you've got your projection maps A and B, to, to A and B, which give you the fact that given any morphism F from B to A and G from B to B, you get a unique map like this. And once we've seen how that works with Cartesian products, this is just a piece of notation really. We usually call that F comma G, because in Cartesian products, you do F comma G on some object V, and what you do is you do you shove V into each of these components. So you get F of V, G of V. So this is in set. That's what you get. Um, now, one key example of this is the special case where you take A and A. So you take the product of A with itself, and then you use the identity maps from A to itself. And this is a perfectly good example of something that needs a unique factorization. Right, so you get a unique factorization here, which is a map from A to A cross A. And we usually call this the diagonal map. Because if you think about what it does in set, then it's going to send A in set, it's going to send A to A comma A. Because it's going to send it to F of A, G of A, but F is the identity and G is also the identity, so it's just A comma A. And this is often a very important part of product structures and something that we use a lot when we're doing products. Um, uh, another important thing to remember is that you can do this in a slightly different way. So if you had a map from X to A, called F, and a map from Y to B, called G, then you could take the product here and the product here. So you take the product of X and Y, that gives you this, and you take the product of A and B, and that gives you this. And now look, if you look at X cross Y going all the way down to A and B like this, that actually is a diagram this is the V up here, and then we've got the morphisms going all the way down the sides. So this is going to produce for us a unique factorization, which is a map from the product to the product, which also came from F and G, but in a slightly different way. And so we call this F cross G often to distinguish it from F comma G. And if you think about what it does in sets, the point is that you have F cross G, but what it's going to act on is something that was already in the product. So this acts on something which is already a pair, x comma y, and you do it pointwise. So f then acts on the first bit, and g acts on the second bit, and that gives you the ordered pair in a cross b. Uh, you can relate this situation to this situation, because in fact, what you're doing in the first case is that you could have, here, what we could have done was this example using V over here and V over here as well. So what we get in that case is a map F cross G from V cross V to A cross B. And if we then compose it with the diagonal, we actually get F comma G, the F comma G that we originally thought of the first time around. Um, so it can get a little bit confusing with the difference between this situation and this situation. So I just thought that I'd mention that for a second. Um, the one other pertinent fact I wanted to mention about products, because it's quite useful for the future if you think about monoidal categories, um, is what happens if you take the product with something and the terminal object, if you have a terminal object. So let's, what should we do? Let's just get rid of everything. Now I said before, that if you have, um, you've got all products, then you get a monoidal structure, and that was a little bit, it was a little bit um, uh, hand wavy what I said there, because I haven't really said what it means to have all products. But one of the things that we'll need if we have a monoidal structure is a unit, and what I'm going to show here is the sense in which your terminal object, if you've got one, will give you something looking unit-like. So the point is, what happens if you take the product of some object with the terminal object? 
Now, I'm going to claim that this sort of acts in a unit-like sort of way because what this is going to give us is something that's the same as what we started with. Um, now, how are we going to, how can we think about that? Well, all I'm going to do is exhibit A as a product of A and 1. And because of um, uniqueness up to unique isomorphism, that's really all that's really all this is saying. Right? All I'm saying is that if you take a product A and 1, the thing you originally started with is a perfectly good one. So how do we prove this? Well, the first thing we've got to do is we've got to show that we've got projection maps. Because remember, a product isn't just an object. It's an object equipped with projection maps going down the side. That's really important. So what could these projection maps possibly be? Well, let's have a look at it. Hmm. Can we think of some canonical morphism from A to A? Hmm. I can think of one. It's the identity. That's a pretty canonical kind of morphism from A to A. Now, what about a canonical morphism from A to the terminal object? Hmm, well, I can make one of those as well. In fact, there is only one. The entire point of the terminal object is that there is a unique morphism from every object to it. So we've got some very canonical feeling morphisms like that. And you should start feeling like if your morphisms you've got a really canonical feeling, then they ought to have some kind of universal property about them. So what's the universal property supposed to be? We're supposed to say, given any other object and maps like this, there's some unique factorization. So can we do that? Now let's just have a quick think about what these two morphisms would be. This one is some morphism F, but this one is a morphism from V to the terminal object. And guess what? There's only one of them because this is a terminal object. So this bit over here doesn't actually give us any information. So all we've got here is a map from V to A. And what we have to produce is a unique map here, making everything commute. Well, duh, what could it possibly be? Well. Could it possibly be F, for example? Does that make everything commute? Jolly well ought to. Uh, let's have a look at the left-hand side. That's the identity. Oh, yes, that's just F. And what's that on the right-hand side? Well, does this commute? It has to commute because this morphism ends at terminal object and this morphism also ends at terminal object. They both start at V. So we've got two morphisms from V to the terminal object. So they've got to be the same morphism because terminal objects that means there's only one morphism from here to the terminal object. And in general, if you have some kind of crazy commutative diagram, if it ends in the terminal object, then all the maps from here down to there, no matter how you go through your, your diagram, will have to be the same. So that's something always useful for the, to notice. If you're terminal there, then your entire diagram simply has to commute. So that is a use of terminal objects here, showing that if you take the product of A and a terminal object, uh, you get yourself back again and nothing happens. Uh, that, I think, is all I wanted to say about that.